My name's Mike Kelly. Uh, I'm going to give a talk on writing your own custom directives. Um, we work for Object Partners, uh, one of the co-organizers for NG Nebraska, along with Bruce and Nick. Um, so uh, you can reach me on Twitter, GitHub, anything you want. So uh, without further ado, what are directives, right? So kind of just, I wanted to start at like the base, most fundamental thing. They're more or less markers, right? They tell Angular where in the DOM to attach behavior that you describe, right? You can kind of think of them as uh, functionality describing what something should do at a particular element, right? So web components might be a good example of uh, something that a directive would do. Um, so what can they do? Well, they can do a lot of things. Right? They pretty much attach functionality to DOM. So some examples, ng click. Well, when you click on that element, it calls a function on scope. ng class sets classes on the element based on Boolean expressions. Um, ng repeat repeats the content of a particular element so many times for a particular collection. Right? Directives can do a lot of things. As a matter of fact, everything in Angular is pretty much a directive. Right? Anything you're doing in the DOM, directive. So why do we want to use directives? Well, um, they're a way to write easily encapsulated code that's reusable and testable, right? There's really no reason you wouldn't want to use directives. So what are we going to do? So I decided that I would rather live code my talk as opposed to go through slides. Um, so what I did was I think in about 60 lines of JavaScript, we're going to write two directives that cover most of the configuration options you're ever going to use. So my hope here is that someone who hasn't written a directive before or new to Angular will not be afraid to approach it because it's pretty intimidating. There's a lot of things here that do stuff that's kind of confusing, right? And then hopefully, uh, other people who are familiar with Angular will learn some stuff uh, they haven't used before, like require and interfacing with other directives. So, I'm going to take a knee here. Do you want a chair? Uh, sure. Thanks. All right. So, let's get started. And uh, just as a note, I'm going to write this in ES6 because I like to think I'm cool. Um, <laughs> so, first, first things first. We're going to declare our module with no dependencies. And we're going to register a directive called SVG box. Simple enough. And we're going to pass it a function. So create our factory function. So uh, directive, basically, what you're doing is you're creating a function that returns a configuration object. So what you're doing in your directive is you're returning a configuration that the Angular compiler is going to use to decide how your directive actually behaves. Right? So first option, restrict. This is where we're going to tell Angular what kind of markers it can actually match. So for this, we're just going to say element. So when Angular scans the HTML, doing its linking, it's only going to match our directive to actual HTML elements as opposed to attributes, comments, CSS classes. So you can match a lot of different things with restrict. So let's say you added a CSS class to an element. If you restrict to CSS, you can actually attach behavior to an element just based on whether or not it has a particular CSS class added to it, which is pretty functional. So. Restrict, easy enough. Now we're actually going to provide a template. Ooh, yes, six. So my template is just going to be an SVG element with width 75, height 175, SVG, and a rectangle inside of it. That is. Slightly smaller. All right. 
So there's one important thing here. Um, this, our template, is, the root element is SVG. So in different browsers, different elements are treated differently. So HTML is treated different than an SVG, which is treated different than math, uh, which I think you use mostly in Internet Explorer. Could be wrong. But because of that, we actually need to declare a template namespace, which is SVG, HTML, or math. Since we're using SVG, we'll just say the namespace is SVG. OK. Easy enough. So in our HTML doc, we'll start, we'll bootstrap our module on HTML, and we'll add our directive. Cross your fingers. Oh my gosh, it worked. We've, we made a box. This is cool. I'm excited. There you go, directives in a nutshell. OK. Now, let's keep building on that, right? Let's add some actual functionality to our SVG box. So with that, we're going to introduce the link function, right? The link function is things that you can execute after Angular has gone through match to directive and attached scope to the particular element. So this is where you can register click handlers, J other jQuery event handlers, um, any kind of element, element manipulation you need to do. Um, would be available here. So element attributes. Attributes is just a, uh, a map of uh, attributes on a particular element that's accessible through an object form. So let's actually first get a reference to our rectangle. Uh, let rect equal element dot find the rect element. And then we'll make a little, we'll make a variable that's going to store whether or not we've turned this particular square on. And we'll initialize it to false. So um, let's write a function to set the fill of this particular element. So get my rectangle, set, a, set the fill property on it to so if is on is true, we'll set the color to, and I actually wrote one down, uh, 00 BC D4, which is like blue, I guess. And black otherwise. Awesome. All right, so then we'll just write another simple function that toggles is on and sets the fill on it. And then we'll initialize our directive by setting the fill by default. So once the linking function runs immediately, we're just going to set the fill. And last, let's attach our click handler so that when we click on this element, we can toggle it on or off. Easy enough, right? So toggle. So element on click, execute toggle. Oop. Sweet. Now, moment of truth. <gasps> Whoa. How about that? Yeah? OK. So we got some functionality now. Now, we mentioned the reusable part. Let's go ahead and make a bunch of these things. Zero, one, uh, I in, zero. Oh, more directives. How exciting. Call this one J. Whoa, now we got a bunch of these squares. And they all light up when you click on them and turn off when you click on them again. Right? So now we have a reusable component that we've just used 16 times without duplicating the logic or any kind of setup. Nice. Sweet. Right, so now, now we're past the jQuery click handler part. <laughs> All right, so now let's, um, let's pass some data into our little square SVG box directive. So to do that, we're actually going to use 
the scope configuration. So scope, at this point, our directive, this is default, is false. So our directive, I believe, shares scope with its parent. Right? So if we were to define a variable on scope outside of our directive, it would be available in our directive. And if we were to define a variable on scope within our directive, it would be available outside of our directive. That's not good for reusability, right? We want to encapsulate all of our business logic without bleeding into other components. So scope is going to let us specify what we're passing into our directive, kind of like arguments, I guess you could think of. So, right? so we're going to pass whether or not it's on, and we're going to use equals binding. So this is two-way. So any changes we make to this on our, in our directive is going to be applied outside and vice versa. Right? Next one we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to do a click handler. Right? So when we click our box, a little SVG box, it is going to execute a function outside. Right? So if we have a controller, it's going to execute that function on the controller scope. Okay? Simple enough. So now that we mentioned that, let's actually make a controller. Yes, lent to the rescue. Easy enough. So we'll say this dot box was clicked function. And we're going to just print something to console. So we'll say we'll pass in the row, the column, and whether or not it's on or off. So console. We'll say box, oh yeah, template strings, right, was turned on or off. Easy enough. Register our controller. Add our controller. Using controller as, which you now know about. Thank you, Alex. Yes. <laughs> I like it. All right. So. Let's go ahead and create a scope variable really quickly. We'll just say ng init. Uh, we'll give it a different name. Is enabled. Is some crazy cool value. Greater than zero. And j. Right? So now we're actually going to pass this into our directive, right? So it will actually fill that in on its isolate scope as is on. So this is how where we get to the argument. It doesn't matter what you're doing outside of the directive, right? Your scope binding is going to pair what you have in your own directive with what you're doing outside. So let's see if that worked. Oh, before we get we go any farther. Now we're actually not using our own declared variable, we're actually using scope. So we need to make sure anywhere we have is on, we just need to change it to scope.is on, right? Because anything that we're passing into the, the attribute called is on is going to match is on on scope. Yes. Right? So now we're actually passing in the state, the initial state for our directive. So that's, that's two-way binding. So if I click this box on or off, right, it should populate the outside scope. So let's check that. So as I turn this box on and off, is enabled should actually change from true to false. But it doesn't. Why? So before we were using a property that wasn't on scope. Right? Any event that comes from outside Angular's context, like a jQuery click handler, Angular doesn't know that it needs to go and update all the values that you have on scope. Right? So it's not going to go update that 
p tag, the content of that p tag, because it doesn't know that is on actually changed. So what we're going to do, easy enough, we'll wrap it in scope.apply, which is actually going to trigger a digest cycle, which will update our scope outside our directive. Cool. Last, let's try this on click handler. Right, so on click was app control dot box was clicked. And we're going to pass in I, J, and status. I should probably actually invoke that when we click it. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yay. OK. So, Right? I and J is actually coming through. I don't know if I can. Oh, awesome. Right? We're getting I and J. Status doesn't seem to be there. So, right, we don't actually have a status out here. Right? Status is contained within our directive. So, when, when you specify the ampersand binding, um, it actually creates a special function wrapper where you can specify arguments to the function that is to be called as an actual object. So here we're going to say status. We're going to supply scope.ison to the status argument. So in our HTML here, right, we have status. I and J are actually defined out here. And status is something that we're supplying. So do you think this will actually work? Uh, of course. So pretty sweet, right? So that's, that's just one important thing to note, is that um, the functions that get bound to the on, onto the isolate scope have a special syntax in a way that you can supply arguments in a, spe in a particular order. So, cool. Well, um, we're not going to stop there. Now, um, we're going to do something real cool. We're going to wrap all of our directives with a, a function that inverts all of their values. Right? So to do that, we're going to just create a new directive. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask at any point in time. I'm just kind of, right? We're going to return our config object. Register our awesome directive. Sweet. So we'll say restrict to element. Now, we're going to get crazy with this. Transclude, which is like the famous example that everyone uses to say Angular is really confusing. And it's a good one. What <laughs> <laughs> um, What did Mishko say? He said it was some computer science term that was invented in like the 1970s to describe one particular thing. And they decided to use it. So perfect sense. So just by saying transclude true, special things are going to happen. And we'll show you what those are. So let's make our template. And we'll just make a div. And in it, we'll create a little button. That inverts all the values. OK. So. Let's wrap all this stuff. Now we should, oh. Dang it. <laughs> we forgot to include. <laughs> 
the ng transclude directive. Right? So before I go on, let's look at what this happens, what happened here. So our our box wrapper actually replaced everything that was inside of that element. If we go back and look at it, like all of this got wiped out because we have a template for our own directive. Of course, that makes sense, right? But what happens when we want to keep that actual DOM, right? We just kind of want to wrap it with something. Well, that's what transclude does. It just wraps whatever's within that particular element. So what you're telling Angular here is that when you encounter the ng transclude directive, take the DOM that used to be inside our directive and place it here. So if I save this, ng transclude, our button's there, and everything else that used to be, that was inside of our element, right, in our template, is also there. Awesome. Let's see what that looks like. Right? So if it helps, the best way I've ever, I ever heard it described is it's like a picture frame. Yes. That's, that's the best example I've ever heard is you want stuff still inside of it, and so you're putting this frame around whatever you want to go inside. That's what transclusion does. Right. Frames basically everything else you want to put inside. So here's our transclude, and then there's all the contents that used to be in there. Cool. So let's actually um, add some functionality to our transclude directive. So we'll make a controller. Easy enough. Oh, thanks. All right, we'll say controller as, because we learned, we know what this does now, as SVG box wrap controller, right? So let's make a function called invert. And Use another directive. They're everywhere. You can never get away from them. Um, and just call invert. Yes. Right? OK, so we're making progress. So now we're at the point where, well, how do we, how do we change the child directives? Right? There's, there's more than one way you can go about it. Um, you could make a property on scope that's like a um, two-dimensional array, right, to represent <coughs> every square. Or um, Angular provides this really awesome require configuration. And what require does is it lets you actually inject a controller from a current scope or a parent or a current element or a parent element into this directive, right? This is how you can make directives that actually talk to each other. Um, not only talk to each other, but actually optionally behave different whether or not something else exists in the parent scope. So by simply saying this, I'm saying on the current element this directive specified on, inject the controller that's in this directive. Right? This isn't going to work because our wrapper is above all of these things. So what we'll say is, okay, if it's not on this element, search all the way up the tree until you find it. Um, Optionally, you could say, search all the way up the tree. If you don't find it, find pass in null, right? Whereas this is going to explode if this doesn't exist. What characters did you use there? Um, that's a caret and a question mark, right? Caret for up and then question mark for optional. And more magic, this gets actually passed in as the fourth argument to our linking function. So now we have actually a reference to this controller, right? So we, this controller can actually provide uh, an API. So we'll say on invert is a function that takes some callback and then adds it to a list of callbacks. Push CB. Right, so now we actually have an API that this directive is going to use. So 
once our directive linking function runs, we'll just register a callback function with it. So now instead of just logging out invert, we will for each um, callbacks, we'll iterate through our list of callbacks and execute them. There we go. Yeah. Not the control, not the name control, but the actual directive name. Thanks, Matt. All right. Moment of truth. Whoa. Directives. <laughs> directives that talk to each other. Right? So without a controller or scope, we've actually built directives that can communicate with each other. Optionally, no less. So. Um, I think in my experience, these have been all the configurations I've used 99% of the time. Um, there are some I didn't talk about, uh, like replace, which is deprecated, don't use that anymore. Um, priorities, where you can change how, in what order Angular compiles and links directives, right? If you want one to run before another, which I guess I haven't really run into an instance where I needed to use that. Likewise, compile, pre-link, post-link, um, Right, where you can really customize how the directive runs at different life cycles in Angular's uh, digest. Um, but I think, hopefully, now if you've never written a directive before, you can actually sit down, approach it, not be scared because you know how all this stuff works. You've seen someone do it. Um, does anyone have any questions? No? Hopefully helpful and informative. Um, yes, that's all I got. <laughs>